The Tour de France must be among one of the world's most challenging, most grueling tests of endurance out there in sport today. What the athletes are trying to do is race their way around an entire country, but they actually do that in stages. So the entire race would last something like three weeks or so. They just completed the, the 2020 edition right now. We weren't even sure they were gonna do it. Now, among the many stages, you could have what you would see here. This is the profile, the elevation gain across a particular stage, and this is a fairly flat one. So they call this a flat stage. Not to say it isn't challenging, but this is the easier days of the routes unlike this stage right here. So clearly the elevation gain right now is, is up and down. These are climbing into the high mountains and it tests the ability of the athletes as much as anything else can. Welcome to your first mountain stage. Okay, today we're going to go over topic seven, or part of it, uh, the idea of standard edition. So what does this fit into? Well, we were talking about calibration, and with calibration, we, we need to use standards. We need to use concentrations that we know to reference against an unknown that we don't. We build up a calibration curve, you go from there. This is a method of calibrating samples. It's a unique process of putting things together, but the reason behind it has something to do with this thing that we call matrix effects. So. We'll talk about what that is. So let's use this as an example. Calcium, it's an extremely important element. It's important in our bodies and we have to get it from various sources. But if you have a calcium imbalance, a deficiency, then you might be going to a hospital, uh, to a lab to get a test to determine how much calcium you have. And here's an example of how that test might work. So again, it's a flame test and we're looking at this instrument where we're injecting calcium into the flame. So the color will change as a response to the concentration. Distilled water, not very much, but when we have 100 ppm calcium, I know it appears maybe orange on your screen, but in reality, this is kind of a nice bright red color that you would get. Now, in case you're wondering, the experiment would not involve taking like a raw blood sample and, and injecting it into this instrument. It would just it'd be nasty, right? Uh, so there would be a, a workup to be done on that, but that's not really what I'm getting at. You see, the issue is, even if we were to somehow clean up the blood, the calcium that's within that plasma sample might actually disappear in the process. Calcium floats around in your blood, but it also will bind to components in the, in the blood as well. So here's a protein molecule, serum albumin, which is extremely abundant, and calcium likes to kind of associate itself with that particular protein. So this is an example of a matrix effect. So you get these binding between calcium, for example, with phosphates that are in your blood or, or, or in, in proteins. Uh, and it's almost like grabbing a hold of the calcium to the point that it's effectively removing it from the blood. So that can interfere with the way that you can measure it. Unfortunately, no one can be told what the matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. So let's see how we can actually work with these samples, try to get the best measurement possible. Of course, if we're going to figure out an unknown, we have to compare it to a standard. And more than likely, our standard solution will be made from distilled water, right? We want to keep it as clean as possible. You could make up a set concentration. Whereas on the other side, our plasma sample, it'll have calcium in it, but it'll have a whole lot of other stuff. And that's other stuff is what's at, at stake here. So what I've plotted here is just a typical example of a calibration curve. This curve would be made for our distilled water sample. So we have different concentrations. Maybe for example, this was 100 ppm and we diluted our way down to get to these various points. For each of the samples, we measure the signal. We put it in the flame and we get a response. So this plots down as a nice straight line. Now just to highlight this point on the curve, here we have our background or our baseline. So this is the level of signal that we get even in the absence of calcium. So our distilled water sample might be reading a number slightly above zero, even when there's no calcium in it. Nonetheless, it's a pretty low value. Now imagine if you will, that you have our plasma sample, despite whatever workup it might've gone through to, to clean that stuff up. It might have a different background because there's all kinds of other stuff in the plasma. So maybe it increases the signal. It doesn't just increase the baseline. What it'll actually do is it'll increase 
all of the data points because each point on that curve is the response from our real sample plus whatever baseline we had attached to it. So the signal pulls up. Now, what does that mean? So let's just say that we did measure the sample. So we put our, our plasma into the flame and we get the measure of light and it gives us a signal value of 15, just to pick a number. So where does that look like on our scale? Well, we have 15 over here. So if we plot it on the scale and work our way down, you can see a concentration of about 40. Likewise, you could put the same on the scale and plot down to a different concentration. Now, the thing is, one of these values is correct and the other one is not. For the distilled water sample, if your sample was distilled water, then sure, this is fine. But what we've measured is a plasma sample. So where does it fit in? Well, you have to think, which calibration curve did we make? We made this calibration curve. So we don't have that signal. This is the real answer, but that's the number that you see. So simply put, you got the wrong answer. This is what you should have had, but you haven't been able to make up this curve. So what you saw right there is an example of a matrix effect. And in fact, matrix effects can change a calibration curve in different ways. So here again, I have my calibration curve for distilled water. Let's just say that we could have made a calibration curve, but we're actually using the plasma and we're representing different concentrations of the calcium within the plasma sample. If you plot that curve, it might look like this. So for example, the slope has dropped down. What does that mean? Well, it means that you have two calibration curves. You have the one that you should get and the one that you actually got, but the readings are going to be different. So if you take the calibration curve that you built and measure up a plasma sample, that's the reading that it will appear. That's the wrong reading because what you should be doing is measuring against the true curve, the tr curve in the presence of the rest of the plasma. So our readings are way off from one another. You have a right answer and a wrong answer, and you're kind of stuck with the distilled water, so you're always getting the wrong answer. So we recognize that as a problem. We know that if we just make up a calibration curve using regular old distilled water, we're not going to get the right answer. Now you could be saying, well, make up your calibration curve in plasma. You could, I guess, but although every time you use that, your, your plasma will already have a certain amount of calcium in it. So that creates a bit of a problem. It is something you can do, but that's not what we're going to be talking about here. We're going to be talking about two different methods. One of them is the method of internal standards, which I'll get to in the next video. But for today, we're going to be talking about this method here called standard additions. So we use it in the situation where our unknown has a matrix interference. It's changing the calibration curve, and we're trying to deal with that in the simplest way possible. All right, let's get down to the math here. It's what you really came for, right? So how does the method of standard addition work? Well, it's actually in the name, standard addition. So what we have right here So there's the name standard addition. We've taken our standard and added it to the unknown sample. So what you actually end up with are two different solutions. On the one hand, we have our unknown. It's just sitting there all by itself. We haven't done anything to it. It's just our plasma sample that contains a mystery amount of calcium in. On the other side, we have a mixture. It contains our standard, but it's actually combined with a little bit of that. What we know about this solution will help us to figure out that one over there. So problems involving standard addition can get quite wordy. So we have a lot of information to deal with and decipher, but well, let's work through this problem right here. So you can read through this problem, pause the video if you need to, but I'll just jump right to the part that matters to us. So from the first part of the problem, what it described is that we have a plasma sample that gave us a response of 15. I did mention in a previous video that you should draw pictures that just help you take this information and interpret it in a simpler way. So this is a good tip. It's especially important when you're dealing with the next part because a little bit more is going on. Oh, and one more thing. You should define your variables. So the question is asking us, what is the concentration of calcium in the plasma sample in parts per million? So I'm going to say let x equal that. 
concentration of calcium in this sample right here. Okay, the next part of the problem's got a lot of information going on. So let's draw out a little picture with it. Doesn't need to be fancy, but we're just organizing that information. We have our standard, it's 50 ppm, two mils of it, and we combine it with five mils of our plasma. The concentration, I just defined it, it's X. I don't know what it is, but I'm saying X is the concentration in here. Not in the mixture, just in that part of the mixture. This whole solution gave me a response of 12.8. All right, let's start putting this together now. You have the two solutions that you measured. And what we need to do is write two equations. So this is just a simple trick for any of these types of problems. Every time you measure, every time you gain a response, you need to write down an equation. And we're gonna use those equations to solve. So here I have a response. So I'm gonna write a requ an equation relating that response. The response will be proportional to the concentration of calcium. So just that. Of course, I don't know what the concentration of calcium is. It's X. On the other side here, we have a lot more information going on. This we have to break down. So the response is 12.8, no trouble. It's related through the slope, no trouble, times the concentration. So what, what are we doing here? Well, think about what a concentration is. Concentration is a mass over a volume. Sometimes it's a moles over a volume, but that's what we're dealing with. So the volume is now seven mils. So there's the volume, it's just the sum total of the two. And the mass is related to the concentration times the volume. So when I'm multiplying these two numbers together, I'm calculating the mass in the bottom solution. This gives me a mass as well. So volume times its concentration, and we have an X in there as well. All right, let's look at what we got for numbers right now. What we have here is two equations with two unknowns. The unknowns are x and s. And I'm actually trying to solve for x. So I'm trying to find a way to mathematically eliminate one variable so that I can focus on the other one. The easiest way to do that is just to take a ratio of the two. So if I set this up, I can divide out the s. It just cancels out. Now I have one nasty equation with one unknown, x. Now I'll go through this kind of quickly, but all you're doing is you're rearranging and solving to get to x. You see here, I'm gonna bring this to the other side. Now I gotta multiply out these numbers. I've got X on one side of the equation. I have X on the other side of the equation. Combine the terms. This is a whole process, but we're just doing algebra here. So we've solved for X. Now I know that was a lot going on in there and I know I went through that rather quickly. All the steps that I flipped through are the algebra. You have two equations and two unknowns. And I know that you've done those types of problems before. Don't look at this as a chemistry problem anymore. The chemistry part of the problem comes with setting up those equations. So you need to be comfortable with setting up the equations and dealing with the algebra. If you're finding the algebra to be difficult, come see me in tutorial. We'll talk about that kind of stuff as well. It is a big deal. It is an important aspect of this class. I'm just not gonna spend that much time going through the algebra right here. When it comes to the chemistry though, what you really need to do is be able to write those equations down in the first place. And one of the challenges with doing that is that you may not even recognize from the problem that it is a standard addition. Standard additions look like a calibration problem. They might even look like an internal standard, which we'll get to. So there's a lot of similar types of problems. Your first objective is to figure out that this is a standard addition problem where you can then apply the process that I just showed you here. So how do we know that this is a standard addition? Well, it could say using the method of standard additions, which would be lovely. Uh, I might not be that kind that I actually give you that information. But looking at it here, what is a standard addition? It means we're mixing, we're combining the standard and the unknown together. So that's the clue that you're looking for. So looking through the problem, it does say that the standard and the unknown were combined together to get us a response. Now we're dealing with that as a standard addition. The other key factor is the fact that our unknown and the standard are the same thing. So that's an important aspect which will make sense when we're talking internal standards. So right now, calcium in the unknown, calcium is our standard. That defines it as a standard addition. Yes, I know this is a complicated topic. The problems are starting to get bigger. There's more information gathered around them. Problems are starting to look like all the other problems and you're even keeping a hold of the, of the previous material that we had before it. 
This is why you have to keep going in this class. You have to be on top of it week by week. You have to be doing your problems. If you're finding any, challenges, any challenges with it, please come see me in tutorial. Please talk about it. Don't let this get ahead of you. Hey, we're always around. And if anything, you can always watch these videos again. So we'll see you in the next one.